Hey everyone, have you ever wondered what the deal is with that Lamech guy in Genesis chapter 4? Or would you be interested in learning about a cool connection to the life of Jesus in the book of Genesis? In today's video, we'll be looking at a passage in Genesis that can at first seem a bit odd, but makes more sense when read in the context of the rest of the Bible, and ultimately connects to the teachings of Jesus in a really cool way. Hey again, I'm DJ and this is Epic Bible Mystery channel dedicated to exploring the relationship between the life of Jesus and the rest of the Bible. If that's a topic you're passionate about, please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this one in the future. And with that out of the way, let's jump into our main topic today. What the heck, Lamech? I was recently reading through the book of Genesis and came across a passage about a man named Lamech that rather puzzled me at first. In Genesis chapter 4, we learned just a few things about him. From the genealogy, we can see that Lamech was the great-great-great-grandson of Cain, that he had two wives and two sons, that each of his sons fathered a people of some distinction. And finally, we're told one last seemingly odd thing about him. Quote, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 to 24, ESV. The passage then goes back to Adam and Eve, and letting us know about the birth of the third son, Seth, and his descendants. Wait, what? Why was this piece of information about Lamech even included? What is it meant to communicate? Or, what the heck? I think this is somewhere that reading the books of the Bible in relation to each other, a technique we'll apply to the Gospels regularly on this channel, can really help us out. In this case, just looking at a bit of what the Bible teaches about revenge seems to bring this passage in Genesis quickly into focus. And fortunately for us here, this will also tee up the Jesus connection we'll be looking at today. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Romans 12.19, quoting Deuteronomy 32.35, NASB. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.18, ESV. When we look at what the Bible, or even just the five books of Moses, which includes Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus that are quoted here, there's a clear message that it's God's place to avenge, and the people of God's role to forgive rather than hold a grudge against their neighbor. Circling back to Lamech's words to his wives then, we can now see that God's promising to avenge Cain, as Lamech alludes to, is consistent with the Bible's teaching on revenge, and that Lamech's own behavior of avenging himself is not. So what do you think the purpose of this information in Genesis is? One reasonable interpretation seems to be that we're told this about Cain's great-great-grandson, as a hint at the degeneration of humanity after Adam and Eve and leading up to the flood of Noah. An example of people increasingly being evil and trying to be their own god, in this case by assuming God's role as avenger. We actually meet Noah in the very next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 5 not long after this, so the context for this passage as foreshadowing the need for the flood seems rather fitting for this interpretation. Okay, one last note before we move on to the Jesus connection, and this is going to be important background for the connection we're going to look at. Other than with God regarding Cain, there are also other places in the Old Testament reflecting God's promise to avenge sevenfold as applying to anyone who harms his chosen people in general. See Psalm 79.12, and also as a possible punishment against his own people for disobedience. See Leviticus 26.21. Now let's pick up the trail back to Jesus. You'll recall Jesus has a lot to say about forgiveness or loving your neighbor and not bearing a grudge as Leviticus 19.18 has it. In fact, there's a point after Jesus lays out how his followers should try to reconcile when wronged by one another that his disciple Peter has a related question for him. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21-22, to 22, NIV. Did you catch it? 
It seems that Jesus wants us to be as enthusiastic about forgiveness as Lamech was about revenge. Or as my friend put it when we discussed this, as if forgiveness was the new revenge. Interestingly, Peter seems to have started things in this direction, almost as if he was thinking, now it's God's place to avenge and my place to forgive. God promises to avenge his people sevenfold or seven times, so if my part is to forgive, is that also how many times I should forgive? Jesus quickly knows what he's getting at and flips the script on him. Look even to Lamech's enthusiasm about revenge and apply that to forgiveness. In other words, forgive until you lose count or better yet, just stop counting altogether. Love keeps no record of wrongs, 1 Corinthians 13.5 also comes to mind. Jesus once again handles a seemingly misguided question brilliantly. Just as Peter's question could be seen as alluding to the Old Testament, Jesus' way of upping the ante in response can also be seen as drawn from a related passage. Now notice one last thing. This connection from Jesus' life and teaching back to Genesis is not explicitly acknowledged in the text. Matthew doesn't tell us where this juxtaposition of seven times versus 77 times in regards to revenge versus forgiveness is coming from. But seeing it in the context of the related passages, do you have any doubt that this connection is there and that it adds context and meaning to this exchange from Jesus' life and ministry? Over time, I found the Gospels to be full of connections like this, just waiting to be uncovered like so much ancient buried treasure. And we'll be looking at a lot of gems just like this on this channel going forward. But what did you think of this connection and the summary of it here? Feel free to let me know in the comments below. And in any case, I hope you enjoyed this first small taste of the kind of insights reading the Gospels in relation to the rest of the Bible can yield. If you did enjoy it, please consider subscribing for more videos on this topic in the future. And until next time, keep digging for that treasure and take care.